the Camp David trial at Rosh Summit drew attention both at home and abroad, with the foreign media outlets reporting the talks as a more than just a gathering of the three leaders of SAR, Washington and Tokyo. In what way was the three leaders gathering a fruitful one for South Korea? What pending tasks are on U.S. President Joe Biden's list of things to sort out for South Korea and Japan against China's growing assertiveness? And how are relations between Seoul and Tokyo looking after the historic three-sided talks? The Kim David trilateral summit was a big deal. U.S. President Joe Biden said as much at last Friday's three-way meetup. Now, how big of a deal do four media outlets think the summit was then? To answer that question, we have Nicholas Smith from The Telegraph. Welcome. Thank you. We also have Anthony Kuhn from NPR. Good afternoon. Hi. All right, let's start with you, Nicola. How successful do you think the Kim David trilateral summit was according to four media outlets? Well, there was certainly a lot of positive coverage. There was an acknowledgement of how uh, strategically significant the event was. There, there was a stress on the symbolism of it being held at Camp David, that mm -hmm. it's very rare for foreign leaders to be invited there, and that when meetings happen at Camp David, they're generally of pivotal importance. So it, that was certainly very positive. There was also a recognition, however, that these bonds between the current three leaders, this new detente between um, Japan and South Korea is actually still in its early stages, mm. it's, it's quite fragile that elections in any of these three countries could derail progress that's been made. So it could lead to you know, a, a new political leader taking it in, in a different direction. And so that was reflected quite a lot in the coverage. And then also there, there, there was, um, it was pointed out that China um, would not view this favorably, no. that it could further strain relations with Beijing, and that it, um, China has um, warned the three leaders not to destabilize the region. We saw yesterday that, that China lodged a formal complaint about some of the language of the, the summit. Um, it said that the leaders had smeared and attacked China when it came to Taiwan or maritime issues. And this was after the, the three leaders had criticized China's dangerous and aggressive behavior in the East and South China Sea. And so you, you also see this reflected in Chinese state media Mm. Um, outlets like the Global Times who called um, the Camp David summit, it said that it, it served um, a hypocritical anti-China um, as a, a hypocritical anti-China pantomime. And so there was some quite strong language in Chinese state media that contrasted uh, very starkly with what we saw in inter other international media. Definitely more rather positive comments among the three sides, Har Washington and Tokyo, and very apparent criticisms and concerns among Chinese media outlets. Now, Anthony, how, how did you read the general sentiment among four media outlets? Well, I thought the coverage was uh, very interesting in the scope of the relationship mm -hmm. that it conveyed and the sort of the number of fronts, uh, cultural, political, economic, uh, that uh, the you know, the three sides had agreements on. Uh, but I was also quite interested uh, to see the domestic criticism mm. uh, within South Korea. Um, and I think, to if you really want to get into the durability of this agreement, whether it'll last, you really have to look at uh, the rapprochement that's going on between South Korea and Japan. And right. what you hear here in South Korea very often is that South Korea is the one that has made all the concessions mm. to get this ra rapprochement underway, uh, that it is a South Korean foundation that is going to be compensating uh, the victims of forced labor during World War II and, and not Japan, uh, and that the U.S. has sort of um, left this issue of uh, uh, resolving colonial era issues uh, to Japan and the various nations it victimized. Uh, from the end of World War II all the way up till now. And the U.S. continues to say, you know, this is the time for Korea and Japan to put aside their historical feuds uh, and focus on current security issues. Well, that's been happening for a long time, too, in some mm -hmm. people's opinion. Uh, right after World War II, the U.S. was focused on the Cold War already and therefore sort of shunted the issue of uh, 
you know, accountability for World War II. Um, so uh, it's, I, I hope that uh, media in general will focus more on the South Korea-Japan relationship mm. in order to help people understand how this rapprochement goes. Right, that's a really good point because the three sides met for mainly for defense cooperation. The, the horror Tokyo ties have been kind of put aside on, at, the, at the Kim Davis summit for now. And this is a very interesting point is, you know, uh, I, I think the general view was that this is not a three-way alliance mm. and that the political climate uh, in, in Tokyo and Seoul will not allow uh, security cooperation beyond, say, the Korean Peninsula. But other people are not so sure. Maybe uh, there will be some cooperation that we don't know about. Maybe it will not be an alliance in name, but there will be more in substance. Right. I do have to stress, though, it was uh, the partnership th between the three sides over the alliance that they called uh, SAR Washington that they have, and also a separate one for Washington and Tokyo. That's right. It's not a three-way alliance. It's two right. bilateral partnership. Lines. Exactly. Right. 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 And also, uh, for you, in what way then was the summit a successful or or, or fruitful for South Korea? What, what do you have to say that uh, what President Yoon Suk-yeol brought home back? Well, I think for South Korea, it's especially on uh, the security and defense nature of the summit. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is a uh, South Korea has major uh, concerns about the North. There was a lot of reassurance on that front from Japan and from America. If you look at the main takeaways, they agreed to hold regular joint military exercises. They've agreed to consult each other more during crises. And I think one of the more significant outcomes was this agreement to establish a timeline for, for when they can um, have real-time data on North Korean missile launches, which is, you know, a very important development for South Korea and helps with, you know, intelligence on, on finding out what, you know, in a timely manner, yeah. what North Korea is doing. And uh, they've set up a hotline, they've agreed to annual summits. And so these are all measures that will strengthen South Korea's national defense. Mm -hmm. um, so that in itself is significant, it's not a, a three-way collective defense agreement, but it does underscore, the three leaders underscored that a challenge to one country is a challenge to all. Um, so that's some significant reassurance on the security front. Uh, you also have, um, on the economic front, agreements to strengthen uh, supply chain resilience, which, you know, we saw during COVID was, was definitely an issue. It could be an issue if there's conflict in the region, if, you know, strategic tr uh, waterways and trade routes are blocked. So th this is something that, that people need to plan ahead for. And they agree to have early warning systems that, that would be of help to businesses who are trying mm. to trade abroad. Um, and then you also have a whole raft of less high profile agreements on issues like cancer research, mm. on um, youth exchanges, on collaboration on tech and climate change. And I, I think those are things that shouldn't be overlooked. Right. They are really bonding uh, for possible challenges and threats, including COVID-19 and possibly from uh, North Korea in the, in, uh, to keep the peace in the Indo-Pacific region and also on the global level. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just North Korea that's presenting right. a challenge mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the region. There's multiple challenges on many fronts which have been acknowledged by both South Korea and, and Japan. Um, we're looking at uh, increasing tensions in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, um, over the Taiwan Strait, and uh, you know, all over the, the Indo-Pacific. Um, China is um, showing an unprecedented mm. military buildup. It's becoming more um, assertive in its regional territorial claims, and that's something that everyone has to keep in, in account. Right, lots of things that President Yoon suk uh, took home uh, back to Seoul. Now, Anthony, then, what did the summit mean for U.S. President Joe Biden, other than the fact that the summit took place at his re uh, president uh, retreat? Yes, well, the U.S. Media, media made a lot of the history of Camp David, mm. uh, and this had been, you know, how this been, had been used as a place for peace negotiations. Um, you know, a lot is made of the fact that uh, the U.S. has pushed very hard behind the scenes to get South Korea and Japan uh, to talk. Uh, they don't say they, they engineered the rapprochement, but they certainly um, set the two sides up for talks on many occasions. And 
uh, just the overall strategy of the U.S. to work through its allies as the, you know, the sort of the linchpin of its strategy in Asia, um, you know, working with its allies to deal with uh, North Korea and China and Russia. So uh, I think, you know, I think, again, there hasn't been enough uh, attention paid in the U.S. to the Korea, uh, South Korea, Japan relationship. Also, mm -hmm. uh, the economic relationship. Um, there, there's a lot discussed at the summit about, you know, semiconductors and electric vehicles. Right. And I think the connection there uh, is that uh, some South Korean uh, and other businesses have been a bit. Um, taken aback at the so-called friend-shoring policy mm. of the U.S. to get them to invest in manufacturing high-tech goods in the U.S. when sometimes their own products are shut out, uh, their dealings in China are affected by export controls, and the criticism mm. has been that if the U.S. is willing to sort of throw them under the bus in, in economic deals, how is that going to affect their interests? in other parts of the relationship. So I think that deserves a lot of scrutiny. Right, but the thing is, some media, foreign media outlets have pointed out that Biden has a lot on his shoulder, especially when it comes to dealing with China's growing aggression on U.S. and also at the same time bonding with Seoul and Tokyo. Now, what do you think Biden has on his shoulder at the moment? Well, yes. I. Th I He's, uh, he's torn, clearly, between uh, domestic and international issues and between the war in Ukraine uh, and Asia. Uh, and um, I think, you know, people in, I, I hear concerns voiced in, in Asia about mm -hmm. what his long-term policy towards China is, what, what end state he wants for that relationship. Um, and, you know, uh, there's, there, you hear concern around Asia that sometimes uh, the U.S. policy towards China is provocative uh, and that it's China's neighbors who are, end up uh, paying the cost, bearing, bearing the brunt because they, they can't move away. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, it's very interesting to see how China's neighbors communicate to the U.S. Uh, their concerns about U.S.-China policy. Definitely. Now, Nicola, uh, Anthony mentioned earlier how not much light was shed on the ties between South Korea and Japan. Now, after the summit, how are foreign media outlets evaluating Seoul Tokyo ties at the moment? I think there's definitely the acknowledgement that that um, ties are stronger than they've they've been in many years, yeah. um, and of how much progress has been made. Mm -hmm. That what seemed impossible, um, even just a few years ago, has happened. You know, just a few years ago, w we had trade disputes between South Korea and, and Japan, legal disputes, and and you know, all of those things are still in the background. Um, they still could destabilize this new detente, but um, there has been a recognition of of how much progress has been made and how surprising that has been since President Yoon reached out to Japan with a compromise um, offer just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you know that has definitely been reflected in the media coverage so far. As I said before, the, there is still um, a hint of skepticism about how long it can last, whether it can outlast the current governments. Um, you know, these are both democracies. Uh, the US is a democracy. Mm. Um, there's so many factors that could destabilize these very strong ties and strong bonds between the three current leaders. Um, if, you know, there's a, a, an ultra leftist um, government in South Korea or an ultra rightist in, in Japan or you know if someone like Donald Trump comes back in mm. the US that that will change the landscape completely but I, I think there has also been um, coverage of of how this uh, this summit has produced um, an agreement that actually goes much deeper as well than just the current um, 
uh, political alliances between countries, um, the, how it transcends in a way domestic politics in terms of institutionalizing mm. certain aspects of it, um, you know, of, of setting the precedent of having these joint military drills, of a trilateral summits, of, of forging bonds between um, the you know, finance ministries, foreign ministries, as well as at a senior uh, leader level. And th that will certainly help to counter the unpredictability of domestic politics. Definitely. South Korea and, and Japan have come a long way, we have to say, up from historical disputes ranging from forced labor and also the pending Fukushima wastewater release plan, which is pretty imminent. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it certainly seems that both governments have been trying very hard to um, find compromises on, on issues that are very difficult. And Fukushima is, is one of those. Um, you've seen that with um, President Yoon's administration, there's been a very rational scientific based approach mm. to this, even though there are domestic concerns, obviously. And that contrasts um, quite starkly with Beijing's reaction, for example, where they have been very openly critical of Japan's decision decision to, to release this water. Definitely lots of concerns and criticisms rising stemming from China. Anthony, how did you read Chinese outlets, media, um, their comments on the trilateral summit? Um, I looked for some reaction over the weekend, actually, and I didn't see a lot. Yeah. Um, the themes they have touched on since then uh, have, have been you know, pretty, uh, pretty much what we've seen before. Mm. Uh, their main cr criticism is that the U.S. is uh, engaging in what it calls block confrontation. It's organizing a sort of a mini NATO type alliance uh, to contain them, to thwart their rise and their development. Uh, they try to, you know, they, they've warned South Korea um, not to bet against China and not to follow the U.S.'s lead. They warn that this will cause all sorts of trouble and incur all sorts of costs for them. Uh, in a way, they seem to sort of take away a bit of South Korea and Japan's agency by suggesting that the U.S. is all behind this uh, and that South Korea and Japan themselves don't have that much um, interest in it. It's just they're being, mm. you know, strung along by the U.S. Mm. Um, but clearly, uh, if this weren't a concern for them, I think there wouldn't be so much pushback. Uh, it's, it's something we see, you know, the, the volume and, and stridency of the, the media coverage has been pretty, pretty strong. Definitely, very, uh, very in an apparent um, aggression towards this trilateral summit. Now, I do have to mention North Korea's reaction, you know. Um, North Korea, in fact, today they said that they're provoking South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are provoking a nuclear war in the, on the Korean peninsula. Now, how did you read that comment? Did you, did you see it coming? Well, I, I think it's quite a, a predictable, typical remark from North Korea. It's always very belligerent. It, mm. it, it's always very militaristic. There's, you know, a lot of bluster and, and rhetoric. And um, again, though, they, they took a couple of days to react. The, there wasn't much reaction over the weekend. The first we really heard from North Korea was um, state media on Monday had released new photos of Kim Jong-un, who was overseeing a, a test of a strategic, um, a strategic missile. Uh, from a uh, cruise missile in, in this in this occasion from a naval uh, corvette and uh, also today we heard that they're going to um, try again to launch a military reconnaissance satellite which people are concerned about um, and this could be seen as a reaction to the Camp David summit mm -hmm. it, and as well as um, the the start of major uh, joint military drills between South Korea and the US, the annual um, Ochi Freedom drills. These are not, these take place every year, but we, we always get the same um, opposition from, right. from Pyongyang. So I think it, in that regard, it, it was expected that they would react in this way, that um, it, we're currently in a cycle with North Korea of, of aggression, of spiraling tensions. Um, they have tested over 100 weapons since the start of 2022. So really, um, North Korea seems intent on building up its, its nuclear and um, missile arsenal. And 
you know, I, I think that would happen regardless of whether there was a summit um, at Camp David or whether there was joint military drills. This is their current intention. Definitely. The month of August is quite eventful at the trilateral summit, the Uji Freedom Shield exercise, the joint drills between Asar and Washington, and also the upcoming satellite launch that they're warning of. That's, that's right. And, you know, even though, again, at the summit, it was pointed out that South Korea, Japan, U.S., they have made overtures towards Pyongyang. They have said we're willing to talk. They've offered humanitarian aid during the pandemic, but they haven't had a response. So it seems that Kim Jong-un is very intent on this path just now. And it doesn't it, it's hard to tell whether he's going to um, veer away from that path and back to the negotiating table. You can never tell. All right, Anthony, briefly before we let you go, you know, the three leaders of South Korea, Japan uh, and the U.S. are trying to uh, put their heads together at least once a year from now on. Now, what will that mean for China, Russia and North Korea in their trio? Well, we haven't seen any, uh, any announcement of plans for them to get together and meet. Mm. Um, and I think what's really interesting to look at is uh, the sort of interplay uh, between the tensions in the East and the tensions in the West. Um, and so, for example, you know, what degree will South Korea and Japan uh, get involved in the Ukraine cl conflict? It was certainly mentioned in the Camp David documents. Right. Uh, but it, it remains to be seen, um, for example, whether South Korea will provide uh, artillery shells to Ukraine. Uh, there's been a lot of coverage suggesting it's already happen, happening. Uh, there have been leaked documents that suggest that. Um, at the same time, there are efforts by Japan, for example, to get, uh, to get Western countries, to get Europe and NATO involved uh, in security affairs in Asia, uh, whether or not uh, NATO's charter allows that. There has cer certainly been a, been a lot of exchanges. Um, but so far, it's, it's all sort of, um, it's sort of under the radar. Also, of course, the, qu the question of whether, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. and South Korea both say that um, North Korea has been supplying arms to Russia as well. They've even gone as far as to sanction people who they believe brokered mm. uh, these deals. Um, but how far will these these go and how far will these, you know, groups of nations like the U.S., South Korea and, uh, and Japan, uh, North Korea, China and Russia um, act in concert? Um, certainly there's already some level of military cooperation uh, with China and Russia doing military exercises uh, that seem aimed at, uh, at probing and, and uh, testing. Uh, the allies in East Asia, um, whether that will ramp up in future, we'll have to see. Definitely. For now, at least China is turning to BRICS nations for its own security bloc. All right. Thank, uh, thank you, Anthony, so much for your time today. And also, Nicola, thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you with Thanks. us. Too. Thanks for having us. We thank you so much for watching Issues and Insiders. Coming up is our Raider Clock.